Welcome to the Transplantation Online Course 2014. My name is Will McCain, I'm a nephrologist in Sheffield and the subject of this lecture is chronic allograft dysfunction. Here's the outline of the lecture. I'm hoping to be able to answer these four questions. What is it? Does it matter? What causes it? And what can we do about it? So what is it? We can define chronic allograft dysfunction in clinical terms or by histopathology. I think the clinical definition is fairly straightforward. Typically, these patients have slowly deteriorating allograft function, as demonstrated by a more or less linear reciprocal creatinine plot, or EGFR plot. They almost all have proteinuria, and likewise hypertension and dyslipidemia. The histopathological classification is more complex. In the Banff 2005 classification, an important change was made. The term chronic allograft nephropathy was dropped and replaced with the phrase interstitial fibrosis with tubular atrophy. Notice that this is simply a description of scarring and doesn't imply any specific cause. One of the reasons that chronic allograft nephropathy fell from favour is that it implied that this was a specific disease and it made transplantation physicians lazy. In other words, the patient was labelled as having chronic allograft nephropathy and no effort was made to establish the cause. The second important change in Banff 2005 was an acknowledgement that for many of these patients there's an immune etiology, whether this is driven by T cells or by antibody I'm going to talk about antibody in more detail later because that has become a very important part of this process. This is a typical Masson's trichrome stain showing extensive fibrosis in green with lots of space between the tubules. Remember that this could be any scarred kidney and is not exclusive to transplantation. This is the typical arteriopathy we see in chronic allograft dysfunction with IFTA. You'll notice lots of duplication in the subintimal layer, but very little in the way of cellular infiltrate. So chronic antibody mediated rejection was more closely defined in BAMF 2005. There were three criteria. First of all, the morphology and patients had to have evidence of transplant glomerulopathy, PTCBMML, which is peritubular capillary basement membrane multilayering or multilamination, and arteriopathy with no other specific cause. They had to have evidence of diffuse C4D in the peritubular capillaries, and evidence of a circulating donor-specific antibody, which is usually an HLA-specific antibody, but not necessarily. To make the diagnosis, you have to have the morphological changes and both C4D and the DSA. If you've only got one of those, according to Banff 2005, you can only make a diagnosis of suggestive of chronic antibody mediated rejection. But we now understand that the C4D stain is not as reliable a biomarker of antibody mediated rejection as we thought it was. It can wax and wane, for example. So in BAMF 2013, it is now acknowledged that there are C4D negative forms of antibody mediated rejection, both acute and chronic. However, to make the diagnosis in the absence of C4D, you need to have moderate evidence of microcirculation injury or worse, or in, research, in the research setting, evidence of endothelial cell activation and injury transcripts by DNA array. Clearly, this is not available in your typical clinical laboratory. There's a useful reference at the bottom there. The hallmark in the glomeruli of chronic antibody mediated rejection is transplant glomerulopathy. This is characterized by evidence of membrane splitting on a silver stain as demonstrated by the black arrow in this high power field of a glomerulus. Again, remember that membrane splitting is by no means exclusive to transplant glomerulopathy. 
The second point I want to emphasise is that you can see acute and chronic lesions at the same time. On the left-hand panel, there's an electron micrograph of a peritubular capillary showing the typical basement membrane multilayering that I described earlier. From the same patient in the same biopsy on the right-hand side, you can see pretty convincing effort evidence of a mononuclear infiltrate in the peritubular capillaries. So does it matter? I think this is the easiest of all the questions to answer. You will have seen many Kaplan-Meier plots like this of transplant allograft survival, showing a linear decline uh, beyond the first year of transplantation. This is a USRDS registry analysis, looking at different immunosuppression regimes. I'll come back to rapamycin or sirolimus later in the talk, but for those of you that believe that the answer to all this is switching patients to rapamycin, I would point out that actually in the US, the worst outcomes are seen using immunosuppression regimes based on rapamycin in the lower curves, and the best outcome is seen in regimes based on tacrolimus and mycophenic mofetil. It's a retrospective analysis, so we can't say anything about causation. And it's common. So 20 to 5 to 30 percent of patients on the transplant waiting list have lost a previous graft. And more than a fifth of the organs being transplanted in the US now are second or third grafts. So what causes it? It's helpful to think about this in terms of input factors. In other words, what was the quality of the kidney that went in? Load factors, how hard is the kidney having to work? And immune factors, to what extent is there acute and chronic activation of the immune system which is damaging the graft? This is a very old cartoon from over 10 years ago, published in a review in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you'll see at the center of this, the now outdated phrase, chronic allograft nephropathy. But it's still a helpful diagram, I think. So on the top right here, we can see some of the input factors, all the donors, ischemia reperfusion injury, all the things that happen to the kidney before it goes into the patient or just as it goes into the patient. On the bottom right, we can see some of the load factors, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and in particular, nephrotoxicity due to calcineurin inhibitors. And then in the left-hand panel, we can see a summary of the immunological factors, matching, acute rejection, and evidence of chronic rejection, which we now believe to be mainly driven by the humoral immune system. In every chronic kidney disease we consider, we know that serum creatinine, the degree of proteinuria, and control of blood pressure are important prognostic factors. Chronic allograft dysfunction is no exception. This was an important analysis at its time, showing that the six-month creatinine had a strong influence or a strong association with the outcome of the allograft. So if you have a high-quality kidney with a good creatinine at six months, the graft survival is excellent. If you have a poor-quality kidney with a high creatinine at six months, the graft survival is poor. Proteinuria. This is a French study. There are plenty of others. And this is looking at proteinuria at two points in time, at one month and at three months, and dividing patients into those with no proteinuria, a little bit of proteinuria, and heavier proteinuria. And you can see that even at a month, this measure separates patients, and those with no proteinuria have better graft survival than those with higher levels of proteinuria. And the separation is perhaps slightly better at three months. We talked about input factors and probably the most important one of those is donor age. So this is United Kingdom data. The older the donor in the heavy line here, the greater the risk of graft failure. There is also a rise in very young donors and this is probably due to the technical difficulties in transplanting children. Another input factor or load factor is the relationship in between the size of the kidney and the size of the recipient. And the first people to analyze this systematically were a South Korean group. They weighed all the kidneys that they transplanted and then they expressed a ratio of the kidney weight to the body weight of the recipient. 
And you can see that the higher this ratio, the lower the serum creatinine, you can see that the higher the creatinine clearance was, but the lower the level of proteinuria. Hypertension, this is a registry analysis from the collaborative transplant study, dividing patients into tartiles of blood pressure. And you can see that the better the systolic blood pressure, the better the allograft survival. The separation is less convincing for diastolic blood pressure. It's important to say that there aren't many intervention studies looking at blood pressure control in transplant patients. So again, we can't establish causation. If I'd given this talk 10 years ago, I would probably have featured this paper heavily. This is a study from Australia looking at protocol biopsies at 1, 5 and 10 years in recipients of kidney and pancreas simultaneous grafts. And the important thing is that by five years, almost all of these patients had evidence of calcineurin inhibitor toxicity. Now, I've talked to one of the investigators in this study recently, and he acknowledges that if they were to look at these protocol biopsies again, they would almost certainly reclassify many of them as chronic antibody-mediated rejection. The other thing to say about this study is that these patients were on relatively high doses of cyclosporin because of their pancreas allograft. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus nephrotoxicity clearly are important, but they're quite a difficult diagnosis to make. Typically, these patients have no proteinuria and evidence of arteriolar level hyalinosis, as seen on this slide, uh, but without evidence of larger vessel vasculopathy. And of course, you can have mixed lesions. There's no reason why a patient shouldn't have both chronic antibody mediated rejection and evidence of CNI toxicity. So what is the evidence for an immune contribution to chronic allograft dysfunction? Well, we know that matching makes a difference, perhaps less so now. We know that acute rejection makes a difference. And we increasingly understand that the presence of alloantibodies makes a difference to the prospects for good graft survival. This is a UNOS slide from many years ago, showing that the best allograft survival were in identical sibling live donor transplants. And the worst, in the bottom line, were in poorly matched, four to six mismatched, deceased donor allografts. So there's nothing new here. In fact, these curves might be closer together in a modern series. This is an important paper from Harry Haran in 2000, looking at projected half-lives. And we can see that the projected half-life of kidneys was gradually improving over this era, but that the presence of rejection made a big difference. And if you had rejection, you had a much poorer projected half-life. In fact, these data have been questioned subsequently because Harry Haran almost certainly overestimated the projected half-lives. But the same principle holds true. We also understand now that acute rejection perhaps has less prognostic impact if the serum creatinine returns to baseline after treatment. This would typically be a mild episode of cellular rejection that was steroid sensitive. The timing of rejection makes a difference. Again, very old data, but important data. So if you have no rejection episode in the top curve, graft survival is the best. If you have an early rejection episode, graft survival is a little bit poorer. But looking at the bottom curve, if you have a late rejection episode, more than 12 months after you were transplanted, this carries the poorest prognosis. This is probably because late rejection is associated with non-adherence, and also because by this stage, patients are not being seen so frequently, and so the delay between the onset and diagnosis of rejection will be longer. What about alloantibody? There are lots of studies, but this is one of the largest ones. This is from Germany, and this is a single measurement of HLA-specific antibodies at a point in time after transplantation. It was typically around five years. And you can see that the patients who had no evidence of HLA-specific antibody had the best prognosis. The patients with a donor-specific HLA-specific antibody had the worst prognosis. And patients with HLA-specific antibody, but which wasn't directed against a donor allele, had an intermediate prognosis. So a single measure of HLA-specific antibody was able to stratify these patients. 
This is, these are the three largest studies of this type. The bottom one is from Sheffield. And you can see that in all of them, there's convincing evidence, looking at these p-values, that the presence of a DSA predicted graph failure. However, if we think of this in terms of a screening test, the positive predictive value is not especially high, highest in the German study with a single measurement of DSA. The second point to make about donor-specific antibody is that it is strongly associated with transplant glomerulopathy and therefore proteinuria. You can see that the patients in this study who, developed who had a DSA developed significant proteinuria. And interestingly, you could detect the proteinuria before you could detect the antibody. So we're building up a hypothesis here that patients develop donor-specific antibody usually directed against HLA, but not always. It may cause acute endothelial cell injury and acute antibody-mediated rejection. Some patients go through a period of accommodation where the antibody is present but doesn't seem to be doing any harm. And both patients that have had an acute episode or without an acute episode over time eventually mostly develop a chronic endothelial cell injury associated eventually with transplant glomerulopathy and proteinuria and ultimately graft loss. Notice that these patients are typically C4D positive on biopsy but in the chronic phase C4D positivity is variable. There has been a tendency over the last few years to think that all late allograft immune injury was antibody mediated. I'm not going to go through the details of this complex slide, it's just to remind us that you can't make class switched IgG donor specific antibody without T cell help. So it would be foolish of us to ignore the T cell contribution to the allomine response even in the chronic phase by the indirect pathway. And there isn't time to show the evidence today, but Researchers looking at patients with chronic antibody-mediated rejection are beginning to demonstrate evidence of the importance of the T-cell response. And in some circumstances, the B-cell is acting as an antigen-presenting cell in this system. So what can we do about it? Well, when you think about any chronic disease, you like to think about prevention, screening and therapy. And you could apply this to the input factors, the load factors and the immune factors. I'm not really going to talk about the input factors further, but I will talk a little bit about load factors, in particular CNI toxicity and the immune factors. Now I'll talk about the trial data looking at CNI minimization, the use of MMF and the use of serolimus. So how are we going to work these patients up? That's a good starting point. I don't think this is too difficult. We're going to be doing a serial assessment of EGFR, but importantly of proteinuria, because many of these patients develop proteinuria before any decline in renal excretory function. We're going to be looking at CNI levels and their variability. Variability in CNI levels is associated with non-adherence. And we're going to be measuring HLA-specific antibodies. I would propose not too often because it's an expensive test, but it will be an important way of stratifying risk in these patients. We want an ultrasound to make sure there's no obstruction, but we also want some assessment of the transplant renal artery, whether that's by a duplex, CT angiogram or MR angiogram. The most difficult question, I think, is do we always need a biopsy? I think the answer to this is that we usually need a biopsy, but there may be circumstances where we feel it's unnecessary. For example, if we have a patient whose primary disease is an IgA, then a biopsy becomes more important because the differential will include recurrent IgA disease in a patient that's developing proteinuria after transplantation. On the other hand, the patient who is 20 years after their allograft whose primary disease is one that cannot recur and who has a donor-specific antibody, it's almost bound to have a degree of transplant glomerulopathy and a biopsy may be less helpful. BK virus is quoted as contributing to up to 20% of patients with chronic allograft dysfunction. I have to say that our personal experience is it's much less common than this. I'm not going to talk in, about BK in this lecture because my colleague, Dr. Arif Kwajo, is going to deal with this separately. And if patients have systemic inflammatory diseases for which there are markers, it's useful to measure them. So an example of this would be DNA antibodies in a patient with SLE. We could take the approach that these patients are just like everyone else with CKD. We're going to control their blood pressure. We're going to control the blood pressure more aggressively if there's proteinuria 
we're going to consider using ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. I'll come back to the value of this later. We're going to treat their lipids, we're going to treat anemia, and we're going to assess them in a timely manner for retransplantation or dialysis. In fact, we're not very good at these basics, and this paper cited below describes the UK experience. So do ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers make a difference in transplantation? Well, I don't think I can answer that question conclusively. This is a very large retrospective analysis from the CTS showing that both graft survival on the left and patient survival on the right are identical in patients treating ACEs or ARBs or not taking them. This is a meta-analysis and it's a very busy slide, but I've highlighted the important feature at the bottom in the red box. So this is a meta-analysis of all the randomized controlled trials of ACE inhibition or angiotensin receptor blockade in kidney transplants. And the outcome measure we're looking at here is GFR. Now, these are tiny studies. So even when you pull all these studies together, you only get about 300 patients in each arm. Well, on average, the eGFR was worse in patients who were given an ACE or an ARB. So there isn't strong evidence to support the uses the use of ACEs and ARBs in transplant patients. My personal view would be that if patients have heavy proteinuria, there's still a strong case for using an ACE or an ARB, but you shouldn't believe uh, that there's hard evidence that improves allograft survival. So what about strategies to, re to reduce the exposure to calcineurin inhibitors? Well, this again is a helpful meta-analysis published in JSON a few years ago by a group from Birmingham. And they looked at all the studies they could find from a systematic review of the literature where there was a CNI minimization strategy included. The largest single study was the Symphony study, and I would encourage you to look at this independently. So there were 4,000 patients, and overall the odds ratio for graph failure was 0.73 for those on a CNI minimization strategy. And typically the GFR was about 5 mils per minute better in those on a CNI minimization strategy. Notice the word CNI minimization, so most of these patients were on a CNI but at lower doses. Some of the studies did include CNI withdrawal or CNI avoidance. So keeping the CNI dose to a minimum does seem to be a reasonable strategy for low or intermediate risk grafts. So what about mycophenolate? Well this is a small study but probably the best randomised study looking at introducing mycophenolate mofetil in patients with what we would now call chronic allograft dysfunction, but what at the time was called the creeping creatinine study. These patients were all on cyclosporin, they'd had a biopsy demonstrating no rejection, and they were randomized to CSA cyclosporin withdrawal and introduction of MMF, or continuing on their same, re same regime. And the endpoint was stabilization of graft function. And it was a positive study. So the yellow bars show patients who were switched to MMF, and you can see that a higher proportion of them had evidence of response in the intention to treat and the per protocol analysis. The only issue in this study was that there were four deaths in the MMF group and most of these were infectious deaths. So there may be a price to pay in terms of an increased rate of infection. The second issue with this study, however, is that in most transplant programs, patients are already on mycophenolate now when they develop chronic allograft dysfunction. So how useful a strategy this is in the modern transplant era is less clear. So there's still a lot of people believe that sirolimus is the best way to avoid CNI exposure. My view of the data is that sirolimus is rarely a helpful drug. This is the largest study where patients were converted to sirolimus in an effort to improve or stabilize kidney function. Now the first thing to say is that sirolimus is a poorly tolerated drug and in virtually all of the switch studies, including this one, 40% of patients didn't tolerate it. The second thing to say is that we typically think about sirolimus once the allograft function is poor. In fact, in this study, patients with an eGFR of 20 to 40 at enrolment did very badly and there was an excess mortality and therefore the Drug Safety Monitoring Board stopped recruitment at this level of GFR. So for most of the study, they were only recruiting patients with a GFR of greater than 40. And they were randomised in a two-to-one way to switch to sirolimus or to continue on their CNR. 
It's a busy slide, I'm afraid, but the important data is in the top panel. The difference in GFR between those that were switched to strolimus and those that stayed on the CNI in an intention to treat analysis was only about one to two mils per minute. And remember that 40% of the patients didn't manage to stay on the serolimus. Now, the authors argued that there was a group that really did benefit in the bottom panel. These were patients with a GFR greater than 40 and no proteinuria. And there they saw a five mil difference. I would argue, however, that if a patient has a GFR greater than 40 and no proteinuria with a kidney transplant, their prognosis is excellent and I don't feel any need to change their immunosuppression. So I talked about screening and the positive predictive value of DSA testing, and this graphic tries to illustrate the problem we're facing in terms of using DSA as a screening test. So we know that the DSA can develop quite early, but we don't detect it for a while, and by the time we detect it, there's already evidence of graft injury. So it's not clear whether this is a true diagnostic advantage. We may well pick up the proteinuria before the DSA. The second thing is, it's very unclear whether we have a therapy that improves this illness. Uh, so there's very little evidence that early detection, detection will lead to improved survival. And finally, we also know that up to 20% of patients seem to have quite stable graft function with the DSA. Some people term this accommodation and we wouldn't want to treat those patients. I don't have time to review all the data, but this is an important question. I'm not going to read the quote out for you, but I've given you the reference from Nature Reviews and Nephrology. And there isn't really any high quality evidence that we have an effective therapy for chronic antibody mediated rejection. There are ongoing randomized controlled trials, including the Rituxacan study in the United Kingdom. So whether you're looking at optimizing tacrolimus and MMF, rituximab, intravenous immunoglobulin, bortezomib, epgilizumab, at best, you're looking at short case series with historical controls. So, what is it? I've described the clinical and histopathological definition, and I've tried to give you an update in terms of Banff 2013. It clearly matters. I've summarized the causes of chronic allograft dysfunction in terms of the quality of the kidney that goes in, how hard the kidney has to work, and the degree to which the kidney is subjected to immune attack. I've talked a little bit about therapy and prevention, as well as CNI minimization. And I've described the immune contribution and how we might tackle this. I want you all to go away from this lecture with the knowledge that chronic allograft nephropathy is really an outdated term that we should try and avoid, and with an increasing appreciation of the role of humoral immunity chronic allograft dysfunction. Many thanks for your attention.